So actually my last name is Tracy Hilton, but my husband, since he, he took the kids when I was writing the book, uh, I just never changed my name. I was just kind of lazy about it. So he said, well, make sure it's under the name Tracy Hilton Mitchell. And then when you see the cover, it's Mitchell on the cover. So he got, <laughs> so whenever people look for the book, they see him. So I am really excited to be here in San Diego. Um, so um, some of you may not know about me, so but you'll learn all about me pretty pretty quickly. Uh, so I have been in recovery for 18 years. Uh, my clean date is February 27th, 1998. Uh, I actually don't remember in particular the day, so that was kind of the day that I stuck with because I was in such a fog at the time. Uh, so how I ended up being here today was that um, I was in a movie called Black Tar Heroin, The Dark End of the Street. Uh, that was featured on HBO. That uh, It featured five heroin addicts living in, in San Francisco. And, um, you know, it was something that I did at the time because I thought that I would be dead by the time I was 30 years old and I wanted people to see that drugs weren't glamorous. So I agreed to do this film for free. Uh, thinking that it would be something that people would see long after I was gone and it might be able to help people. Uh, but actually, before the film was even released, I had ended up getting off drugs. So my journey is uh, an interesting one uh, and one that I'm not afraid or ashamed in any way to talk about. So I felt like uh, early in my process of getting off drugs and sort of changing my life and, and reinventing myself that there was sort of... Um, a selfish nature to individual recovery where people are afraid to talk about the life that they had had before. And, and that's fine for most people, but I, I felt like for me, I needed to uh, broaden my experience. And so there have been times when I, especially when I had my children and they were very young, I was very private about my experience. But um, as things have escalated with you know, the various drug problems that we have here in the United States in particular, I've been very, a very vocal advocate and very out front in the media, writing articles. And also I've been running, um, I've been working in various naloxone programs and I actually run a naloxone program out of my closet. I've been doing that for, for many years um, and it's helped save, I think now it's like 184 lives, um, places where there, there's no access to naloxone. So, um, so recovery and helping pe other people who have various addiction problems has sort of been the focal point of, of my life for a long time. Um, so just, you know, just to talk about myself a little bit uh, and how I ended up at this Life Ring conference was, I, uh, I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm actually from a place called Westchester, which is outside. It was very rural when I was growing up, but now it's sort of like mall America, like everywhere else, sort of everywhere is um, it's the same, like 10 chain stores that are there uh, in the suburbs. But at the time I was living there, it was like a dead end street and you would go, your parents would let you go and you would catch snakes or whatever. But um, my father was a very, he developed a very um, severe alcohol problem in the 70s. Um, and so uh, in the, you know, this was during the recession, um, if some of you are old enough to remember that in the United States. Uh, so there was, um, at the time people didn't really talk about you know, drug and alcohol issues that you had at home. It was sort of like, you're just gonna work this out yourself. Um, but the school actually got involved because I was so, I was so depressed. So I was walking around in my pajamas for weeks at a time. And um, they, I was diagnosed as having depression when I was 12 years old. And it was sort of, sort of unusual. Uh, they got involved because there was like a camping trip at the school and I had refused to go because I didn't wanna talk about my family sort of at a group level around other people, what was going on at home. Um, there's, uh, there's long histories of addiction in my family. Um, so I don't know, people say, well, is addiction genetic or is it you know, uh, being, exposed, being exposed to childhood trauma or what are the reasons that people get involved with drugs in particular? And I would just say my particular um, precipitating event for getting involved with drugs was really around my mental health stuff. Uh, so I would say my first, serious relationship with any kind of drug experience was really with food um, because food uh, it, eaten in large amounts would give me sort of like the same satiating feeling that drugs gave me later on and that's really been um, so sort of like the highlight of the big fix is really there is no big fix uh, because I tried you know relationships food uh, 
various kinds of drugs. I tried all these different things, shopping at different points to make me feel better about myself, and it really can't, had to be internal work that I did. Um, you know, I did individually, and then also working in various group settings. Uh, but so, um, sort of going on in my life, uh, I was I was very sort of straight laced. Uh, and was into, you know, nerdy things like Star Trek and Star Wars. And um, I was in the, you know, the gifted and talented classes that they had at school. Uh, I didn't really get, ex so around the teenage years when people were sort of experimenting with drugs and alcohol, um, I, I tried drugs for the first time. My sister had used drugs. I tried drugs for the first time when I was like six or seven years old. They would give me weed and think it was funny to get me high and stuff like that. So when I um, got to my teenage years, I wasn't really interested in that, but I remember being um, 17 years old and I got my wisdom teeth pulled and I was exposed to Vicodin. And I really, really liked the way that, um, the, the way that that made me feel, which was sort of the experience of fuck it, uh, I don't care anymore. Um, and that was really, uh, you know, going through various things in my life um, sort of changed my perception of reality. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about um, my drug use in particular, but Needless to say, my drug of choice was really more. Uh, so I, I spent a lot of time. Um, I ended up being a homeless drug addict in San Francisco, uh, you know, living in an alleyway. Um, I had a poly substance addiction, so I was using uh, the last day that I used drugs. I used heroin, crystal meth, benzodiazepines, alcohol, uh, and marijuana, and sort of that was my cocktail, you know, and cocaine, crack. Uh, I mean, every day there was something different. Uh, and I don't really know how I ended up in that place. Like, how do I go from being a university student with this, like, bright future to being this drug addict? But I knew <clears throat> the whole point of me writing The Big Fix was when I first got into recovery, there was, I didn't know a lot about, I didn't know anything about recovery because I never knew anybody who was in recovery. I don't know, I never knew a person who had gotten off drugs uh, and I remember going to the 12-step meetings, and they, people would tell their stories, and I never heard another woman who had a story like mine ever. Like, I never, you know, my experience of being raped, of having been involved in prostitution, of all these different things, who had actually lived the life that I had led and got better. So a lot of me crafting the past 18 years of being off drugs has been around my sort of experimentation and what worked for me and what didn't work for me. And I think that really is sort of the... Um, the crux of, of re having recovery by choice. I stick with what works, and as the years go by, what works might be completely different. And that's where I really needed, was I couldn't be stuck in one particular thing, um, because as, as they, they call it the layers of the on onion or whatever, but as time went by, I saw a need for different, I had different problems in my life. So, you know, the first year of me being off drugs, was really about, you know, I had, um, I had 34 abscesses. I had all these different health issues. I had to have my teeth redone. Um, I had nowhere to live, so I had to get out of, I lived in a, a room in a sober living facility for four years with no bathroom in, the, in one of the worst neighborhoods of the city and, and didn't use drugs. Because I really was focused in on what my individual goals were. And then also, um, I had to be realistic with myself. I had to spend, for me, one of my you know, sort of precipitating things around my drug use and my alcohol use would be around me getting involved in these relationships with dysfunctional people. Uh, and I would always try to be the fixer, or I would be this per I'd be involved with these different people. So I spent a lot of time by myself alone because I didn't want to get involved in those relationships, and that's very, and that's very, very complicated. Um, we need other people, or at least I needed at that stage, I needed other people to try to help me because I didn't know how to help myself. But on the other hand, I wanted to make sure that I didn't get involved in another, yet another dysfunctional relationship um, with someone. And so that was, you know, a very, a very, very challenging process. Um, I didn't even really know what a healthy relationship was. And, and then, then there was also the process of reuniting with my family members and trying to figure out how I could integrate my family members back into my life knowing that some of them have, you know, drinking issues and that I was going to have to deal with that. So, um, and even now uh, being, you know, I've been with my husband now for 16 years, um, being a person who, so for, my, for me personally, I believe that abstinence is the only way that works for me. 
What other individuals choose to do, I have no control over that. And that's really, you know, that's, that can be very challenging, especially if you spend a lot of time in a 12-step environment where sort of like people who are not in recovery are sort of demonized to a certain extent. But then when you have family members, you have other people who are not interested at all in recovery and have a whole totally different process. You have to navigate all these different kind of worlds at the same time. Time and so that was something that I had to learn how to do, uh, especially in early in early recovery. I started getting involved being a drug counselor, and so um, they tell you you can't, you know, your clients are not your family, uh, but I thought they were, of course. So I went and tried to help people or fix people, and so I, I I ended up becoming, you know, and learning to know my mother in particular in a totally different way um, in the process of getting off drugs, and that was. And that was really uh, a critical piece of how I managed to, you know, completely transform my life was having one supportive person in my life who was sort of like the overarching person. But then at, you know, in 2009, both my parents died. So then how do you not go back into those same behaviors of the people say they call it a yet or whatever of drinking or using drugs again or choosing unhealthy behaviors again when sort of like the solid rock in your in your you know your program whatever your program is then isn't there so I had to learn how to navigate those particular situations uh, and then going back to school so I went in to uh, apply through so I'm a convicted felon uh, I had to go in to college through an ex-offender program which uh, was humbling to a certain extent because uh, I didn't think I, I went to the orientation with all my little stuff, and I was, you know, I had my little uh, badge from the school, and they had sent me in and said, oh yeah, just bring your transcripts and, and you can sign up for classes. And they told me at the orientation that I couldn't get into school because my, my GPA was too low. And I cried for the, I didn't cry the entire first nine months that I, after I had discontinued my drug use. But having that happen to me, having sort of the frame of whatever future I had just disintegrate in front of my face, completely disabled me in a way that I wasn't prepared for and I cried and I cried and I cried and I cried I cried the whole so I was what 30 minutes from my house I cried the whole I was on public transportation I cried the whole way home I couldn't stop crying and it, and it wasn't that I was crying I was first of all I was super embarrassed but it wasn't just that I was crying for um, for this event but I was crying for all the other things how I had traded my whole life at the time I was you know 28 years old I had traded my whole life, my whole future, every dream I had ever had, I had traded for these drugs and alcohol. And, and that was devastating for me um, to face that sort of feeling inside of myself where um, I had to come to the reality of like the things I had done. I think that every person's process of how they, um, they deal with the damage that they've done to other people and done to themselves is different. Uh, but that was sort of the precipitating moment for me to say, oh my, what have I, you know, kind of what have I, I done? But um, I ended up going to, I went to school for nine years and got two degrees. I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, and I'm also a, a state certified substance abuse counselor uh, and a substance abuse counseling supervisor. So I had gone through all this whole process of, uh, of rehabilitating myself. Um, but that, you know, that happened through every year, it seemed like there was something different that I, that I needed to work on individually. At one point, I would say that um, sort of, you know, wor you know, working and going to school was my entire life. I really didn't know how to um, engage with people, and that's because I realized, I guess I had about a year or so clean or maybe two. So the first year was really about starting my rehabilitation process, and the second year, started uh, the process of me getting into sort of my emotions and my relationships with other people, and that's when I was diagnosed as having um, complex uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so I had experienced um, I, some very violent incidents in my life uh, where I was having really severe flashbacks, and so I had to, um, so I was interesting that he had talked about, it's kind of interesting going after the, the, the real science-based person, but I had, uh, Ex gone and had EMDR done and so there were various things where <clears throat> they had recommended well you just go just go to 12 step and you're going to be fine I said well that's just not enough like all the things that you want are just not not enough and actually that's when I got involved 
Uh, so the Life Ring book that they had, Recovery by Choice, was a little bound book that came out at the time. Um, we had the, it, it looked like somebody had put it together in their living room. I'm not really sure where it, where it came from. <clears throat> but it had, you know, it was sort of, definitely the, the production value was very, very low. Uh, but the, but the, you know, what was in it, I really, I resonated with was sort of that looking at your own individual process by yourself and then also sharing that with other people like they had talked about termites, the things that get inside your mind. And it was interesting seeing other people think the same way that I thought about individual events. Um, and I, I would say the first few years uh, that I had, you know, I had gotten off drugs, I had a lot of cravings and then sort of I'd have periods where cravings would subside. And I've come to think of sort of drug cravings as, you know, your relationship that you have with alcohol and drugs is like an abusive relationship that you've been in. I call heroin in particular the, the Ike Turner of drugs. So you start out and you have this great relationship and everything is going really well and you look really good and you're on this honeymoon period and you make all this beautiful music together and then it starts beating your ass all the time. And then you can't decide if you want to leave because there's still like this beautiful music that you're making together. And then over time you finally decide to leave. And then, but you hear these songs that still remind you of that feeling that you had. But then I have to remember that that's not something that's healthy for myself. So I, so I look at my relationship that I had, and I think of it as a relationship with drugs and alcohol as being like, if I give up this one set of things, I can have everything as opposed to sort of a deficit base, like, oh, well, I had to give these things up. It's like, but really, I only have to give up this one set of things, and then life just completely opens up to me. But then the state of addiction, to me, is focusing on this one set of things that I can't have, like constantly obsessing about whatever it is. It could be a relationship, or it can be, um, you know, I want somebody puts out the piece of chocolate cake, and I really want that cake, or whatever it is. And uh, and I just start obsessing about something that I can't, I can't have. And then when I do, I ignore all the things, sort of like when you're on your cell phone and you ignore everything. That's, so I was, at the I was at the beach earlier. You know, people were looking at the harbor seals. And then you see the people that are so focused on taking the pictures, they don't see everything else that's going on in their life. We're at this beautiful beach. There's harbor seals. There's, you know, kids playing in the sand. And there's a certain segment of people who are so focused on just getting the selfie. And to, it's just so focused on that. And that's, to me, <clears throat> where, you know, you get so in, in you know, if you're coming, recovery, uh, you know, it's in interesting that we've done on this work recently around languaging. It's like, well, do I call myself an addict? Am I a person in recovery? Do I even use the term recovery? And, it cha and that has to change over time, too, because I call myself at various points a junkie because it really creates an affinity for me because people understand where I was coming from. But then at other points, I don't really use that. And then other people don't, but other people hate that term. Oh, a junkie. It's like, well, I was shooting up in the bombs of my feet. I don't know what else you would call it. You know what I mean? I don't, I, you know what I mean? It kind of, when you think of it, that pretty much sums up my experience. But then some people get like super offended by that. Like, oh, but then, but then, some, but if somebody else were to call me a junkie, I'd be super, super pissed. Like, oh my God, they called me a junkie, but... But, you know, so, and that's, and that's the thing about our personal process that we have to look into is sort of like where, where am I at from year to year with different things. And, and I specifically wrote, I, you know, I wasn't really here to show my books, but, I, you know, it's nice if people buy my books. But, I mean, the reason why I wrote this book was I always felt like you get it, you, you know, you're trying to get off drugs and you read all these books and all of this is an elongated war story. Like, I used, I used, I used, I used, I used. I used, I used, I used, or I drank, or whatever. And then the last chapter is like, and then I quit, and life is great. Yay. And it's like, but that didn't tell me anything about what you did at all. Uh, so I, my book is like 15 years of me being off drugs and not a whole lot of me. I mean, I, you know, I tell a few stories about me being on drugs, but not really, um, because I thought, well, you know, no one really talks about that. It's like, in some ways, the getting off drugs is the easy part. It's the staying off drugs that's a really, or staying off alcohol that's really complicated. I mean, it, even in my house, my husband is not, he's not a person in recovery. He drinks. It's like, there's been various times in my life where my mouth is watering because I want to drink, you know, especially um, I went, 
I remember I had like I had been off drugs like nine months, and so my family was like, "Okay, let's go. Let's have you come home, and we'll have this visit." So I said, "Okay, I'll come home. We'll have this visit." So the visit never never do this. Never go for two weeks. Uh, two weeks, and I had no car, and so it was. We took I call I used to call where I my parents' house the Museum of Dysfunction because everything was perfectly preserved like where I left it. So I went, and there was like my acid wrappers, and like, you know, there was a syringe there I had left there like nine years. I don't even know where it came from. There's all these different, my pictures of Prince and Duran Duran, and I had marked all over on the walls, and like Matt Dillon was there, like all from 16 Magazine. Like everything was, per everything was perfectly preserved, and not in a healthy way at all. So then we spent time at the Museum of Dysfunction. Then they put me in my room from childhood, and my dad is snoring, you know, he's drunk and snoring, and then I was... All these emotions are stirring up, and uh, then we took the Museum of Dysfunction on the road, and we went to my brother's house, and um, so the sort of like the culmination of this trip was them toasting me with their alcoholic beverages. Oh, we're so happy that you're home, woo! Uh, and I just remember, um, yeah, imagine that. So this is this is Christmas time. So I'm. And then my mouth started watering, and I wanted, to have, I wanted to have drinks so bad. I was like, oh, I want to have a drink. And, you know, they tell you all those different things you're supposed to do. And I went, and um, I said, oh, let me, I just need to get away from people. And I went into this room, and I said, you know, higher power, Buddha, Allah, I don't know what you are. I don't know if you exist, because for the most part, I don't live my life, um, you know, catering to any kind of religion. But I was like, I don't know what you are. And then, you know, some common sense came to my mind, I realized they can have a drink and still own a home and still have a life, and I'm going to have a drink, and I'm going to go in the snow and find some crack because that's who I am, and that's who they are. And, I, and you know, that feeling actually gives, I mean, when I'm realistic with myself, it gives me a feeling of just relief. When I know who I am, and I'm totally okay with it. I know who I am, and I'm, to, I'm totally okay with it. So... I just had a sense of relief, like, okay, well, that's true. You know, I'm okay with that. I, and knowing who I am as a person, so, you know, I've had in, in the time that I've been off, uh, you know, that I initially quit drugs, I had three C-sections, and I, had, I was prescribed opiates, and it was, like, the, the biggest fear in my life. Because they get, you know, you get so afraid, oh, I'm just going to end up in that crack house, if I'm just, and they're going to get me on opiates, and I'm going to start using and I had, uh, with, I had a, I was, and I went through withdrawal with a newborn just from the medication that they prescribed me. The baby's screaming and my legs are twitching because I'm prescribed these opiates. I had an emergency C-section. I had to get prescribed medications. And I think at a moment like that, so one of the, the premises that I, I like to talk about is whatever recovery program you have, it has to be flexible and it has to be tailored to you individually. It has to be something, it can't just be in a book or it can't just be, you know, one year it's meditation. Another year it's me working out of the recovery by choice book. Another year it's me. I remember thinking, yoga, that's so, oh, that's so stupid. Why would people do that? And I did yoga for like two years. The whole time I'm like, oh, it's so stupid, but it works. I don't know what it is, but it's just helping me. I don't know what. Because I needed to get out of my mind. You know, another year I really spent a lot of time focused on, um, you know, therapy, working on specifically my mental health stuff. So I'm a person that um, I'm not against medications anyway. I personally have not taken them. Uh, I, although I, I had, so I had 15 years clean or 14 years clean, and I just, they discovered, I started having panic attacks, uh, which I wasn't, ex, you know, I wasn't expecting. Um, I thought I was kind of over the hurdle. Oh, well, all the bad stuff's kind of over with now. Um, I'm cured, you know, whatever it is. Not that you're cured, but sometimes you think you're cured. Like, oh, I'm cured. But then you're like, oh, no, I really am not cured. Uh, so I started having these panic attacks, and I realized that um, whatever I had going on in my life, the program I had set up at, at the time, I had to, I had to adjust that because I had three little kids. Now I have, you know, I'm married with three little kids depending on me, and so I have to adjust my life to try to, figure out where all this stress and where all this anxiety is coming from. And I had to deal with, you know, panic attacks and uh, so many other, you know, so many other things over the years. But I ha but the constant thing is that I haven't used drugs and I haven't drank alcohol around those um, because I have a program that's flexible. Let me make sure I'm not missing any of my points I definitely wanted to cover. Uh, excuse me. 
Um, and so the, you know, so another thing about the sort of lack of narratives of long-term recovery. So some people have, you know, some people are very private about the fact that they um, were a user. So my, my life in terms of being of service is me talking at a public level about me having been a user. And that, you know, can invite a lot of public scrutiny or, or scrutiny from other people. But, um, you know, for me particularly, we have with the, you know, what they call the opioid ep epidemic in this country, we really have a deficit of hope. Um, so there's sort of this prevailing belief, and there definitely was when I was getting off drugs, that only one or two percent of heroin addicts ever get off drugs. And that's not true. All the research shows that's not true. It's absolutely not true that the majority of people who use heroin actually get off drugs and stay off them, you know, but it takes a while. So it doesn't matter if you've been to rehab 16 times, you only have to do it right one time and make it last for the rest of your life. So we have this sort of deficit of hope where people believe, well, I can never stop or I can never get clean, and that's not true. So what I said was, you know, if you want to use me as your personal example, I can show you pictures of myself. Where I, look where I was and look where I am now. I went from homelessness to homeowner. I went from isolated to having a beautiful family. I went from, you know, completely disenfranchised from society. You know, currently I run uh, mental health programs for the city and county of San Francisco. I run peer-run mental, mental health-based programs. I manage, you know, like $4 million worth of contracts, and I also directly run uh, a peer-run psychiatric respite program and another program that helps transgender women of color. Like, I have these positions in society, but, you know, I used to have a shopping cart. I absolutely did. I, absol I absolutely did. So, so I don't have any problem going out and telling, and telling my individual story. Um, but that all came from, you know, customizing whatever it is that's helping me get better year by year and, and really formulating that into a life. Uh, and, so one, and so for me, sharing my, you know, I'm happy to be here and sharing my individual story with other people and then also sharing hope because I, I feel like if somebody told you that if you got off drugs and alcohol that it was just, just going to be this terrible life, you wouldn't want to do it. But it's like really, that's really what sparks the life into people is thinking like I can't actually change. And I feel like I'm a kind of a living example for that. So I wanted to leave room for questions because I always feel like people come and do these presentations and they never let people. And you can ask me absolutely anything. There's nothing that's going to embarrass me at all. Yes. So I would say my book covers, so there's a whole, the back part of my book is whole, one whole section on education. So it's education on MAT. It's education on naloxone. It's education on heroin. It's education on... Uh, gender specific needs for services, so specifically the needs for, for women to get uh, treatment uh, that may be different from male dominated treatment. Uh, and then my book is this, and then the rest of the book is a narrative specifically about my life. So it doesn't necessarily, so what it helped me was um, the specifically the relapse prevention section, working through that. I, I, I have never, so I actually is used the recovery by choice with people in a treatment facility. So we would copy off some of the different worksheets and work through them with clients, and it seemed to be really helpful. We would do that for a few weeks at a time, um, helping them identify their triggers. There's also a, a, you know, a section in different substance, the SAMHSA tips. So there's one on stimulant treatments, helping people identify their triggers. We would copy some of that stuff off. I think that um, some of the best you know, there's evidence-based treatment models, and some of those are good, but I think specifically there's different kinds of uh, elements to the San Francisco Bay Area that are unique, where we need a lot of different things. So there's a lot of, um, you know, trying different things and seeing what works with the clients. But the part that I like specifically about the workbook is that sometimes you're sitting by yourself, and there's no one else around, and you really need something just to be able to kind of give yourself a checklist and be able to run through things like what's going on with me and... Um, you know, you'd have, I'd be triggered by something or something would be going on in my life and I wouldn't really understand my thought process. But to see that another person thought enough about it to write it down kind of gives you a sense of comfort. Like, oh, that's not just something I'm going through. Someone else actually went through that same thing and thought enough about it to write it down. That's why I thought it was funny when Byron said one person mainly wrote the book. It was like, one person thought all these same things. Well, who's he? I want to know who that person is. But <clears throat> so that was, that's my, that was how I went through the workbook. And that... Um, you know, I got clean, 
uh, or got off drugs or whatever you want to call it. In 1998, um, the, the, our options were so limited at the time. So one of the things I wanted to highlight in the big fix was that we need a wide variety of options for people. Um, when I got clean, it was rehab. Uh, a lot of it was based around attack therapy. Uh, were they that was based on this sort of synonym model where people would sit and attack you or 12 step only so I was an atheist at the time that was very challenging for me I, I would say I vary between being atheist and sort of a Christian but you know it's it really varies over time um, but it you know and, and that kind of didn't fit and uh, then sort of the last thing was going to strictly to church and so there wasn't a lot of variation so now it's a uh, it's a unique time because we have 10 times as many different kinds of drugs as we used to have back then, and we have all these different kinds of treatment interventions. So that's, and that's good. I feel like, I tell people, did you, so if you, if you were using drugs, if you called the dealer and they said that they were out, would you just go home? And they're like, no, I would go someplace else. I say, well, if you didn't get recovery, were you, the, way, the recovery that you needed in one place, would you just give up? And they say no. I said, well, then go out and find something different. Go out and and now there's a very vari- now there's a variation. Now there's other things that you can try. So that's one of my famous lines. You can use it if you want. <clears throat> so just don't give up. Try something new. Yes. So I would say the average person, if you wanted to, if you're not working in treatment, and you want to do something for someone. Sometimes just being compassionate. Um, if you can't, if you you know I. You can buy socks or hygiene products or whatever and give them out to homeless people. You know, I would never give people money in particular. Or leave your food. If you go to a restaurant and you have food left over, give them food or bring them sandwiches or do whatever. I think that when you are that deep into your level of addiction, you feel so isolated. Because I, 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 as a matter of fact, I just got interviewed by The Chronicle on Friday or Thursday. Yes, I've lost track because I'm on vacation. So anyway, on Thursday... I got interviewed by the Chronicle, and they were asking me specifically, they're doing a story on homelessness, and I said, you know, when I got to the point where I was sleeping on the sidewalk, I, I thought to myself, how do you even get out of this situation? It was like the, the levels of problem sets were so huge, like I have nowhere to live, I have PTSD, I'm, you know, underweight, I have health problems, I, you know, so many things. But I would say that what made a huge difference for me, and I also talk about in my book, was I would go to meet the people in needle exchange, and they would be so nice to me, and they would tell me, you know, you don't have to live like this. Or just people being nice to me. And, and compassion really goes a long way. I had, I mean, being a homeless person, I had people throw bottles at me, people kick me. These are just random people that just come up and are cruel to you for absolutely no reason other than the fact that you exist. I'm existing. And so for me... Uh, just, you know, being compassionate to people. And I would always say, if you're going to approach someone, you go in a team, like an outreach team or whatever. But just being compassionate to people, it really it really makes a huge difference. I would say that um, my story is unusual, but it's, not, it's, but it's not so different than anybody else's story. When you are in a place where you're completely despondent to the fact that, that substances is overtaking your whole life, all you really want is someone just to be a friendly face. So a lot of times when parents approach me and they say, my kid is so completely into their addiction and I want to do all these things, what do I do? I say, why don't you take them out to lunch and not talk about their addiction for once so they feel like they still have some kind of connection with you because it all becomes all about fixing that person and not nothing about the relationship. So there's this, all, there's this whole school of thought right now that the opposite of addiction is connection. When you build a connection with a person, you actually draw, you actually draw them in and what isolates people even more into their addiction is feeling disconnected from absolutely everyone and everything in society. How do you feel about your husband drinking alcohol? I would say that's his business. I, it's, it, I mean, he doesn't have a drinking problem. I, you know, he doesn't. So if you're, if you're a person that's in recovery, you have to decide, am I only going to stick to the same gene pool? Am I only going to go out with people who are just like me? And that creates this whole another set of issues. So, uh, so it's sort of like the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. Um, so he, I mean, it, it, it doesn't bother me. It used to bother me. But, I mean, but he never was like in his face, in my face with it. But it's kind of like I had to realize like, uh, other people's recovery 
is another section. Other people's recovery, if you choose, if you're on methadone or you're on suboxone, that doesn't impact me and my recovery. If you are not in recovery or you're just a normal person, that doesn't impact me because I have to control my lane. I have to stay on my lane and control me. And so I had to look at myself, am, am I comfortable? Now, if I were to go out into social situations and people are drinking a lot, that I don't feel comfortable with. And I'm, I'll leave. I mean, I usually try to carry 20 bucks with me for cab fare or call Uber or whatever to, to get the fuck out of there if it bothers me. Because sometimes it does. And uh, But, you know, so it, sometimes, it, sometimes it doesn't. And I work in the field, I'm not so much in recovery, mostly in mental health now, where um, I'm around people who are on substances quite a bit. And sometimes it bothers me and sometimes I could care less. So, it, it, But each individual, that's part of tailoring your recovery by choice. Each individual you have to decide. In early recovery, just the smell of alcohol, it used to trigger me and make me think about this man who'd raped me and all this other kind of things. But now it's not, that's not the things that trigger me. Now it's more my emotions if I get over, if something happens and I feel overwhelmed. Um, and every, everyone's process of feeling overwhelmed can be different. Uh, some people talk about going on eBay, they feel overwhelmed and buy stuff they don't need. And uh, other people it's food. Other people it's calling that person that you know you shouldn't call. You know you shouldn't call them, but you call them anyway and get back involved with them. So it really, it really just depends. I feel like, a person, so I've, I feel like if a per, he is a person, if he, he has, so I've been out to dinner with him, if he has a beer, the beer might sit there for an hour. He's not me. He has a totally different, you know, set of, he likes beer for the taste. I've never drank beer for the taste in my life. So uh, if I ask him, will you not have a drink today or whatever, he'll do that. But there's no barrier between our, it's not, I mean, it's not something in between our relationship, but I would say that, you know, globally, when you think about people drink everywhere, and some, in some ways, we can't completely tailor our life to cut all those people out. I've tried that. I did that. I was one of those super big, and I would say the first maybe three or four years of my recovery, I was super big 12-stepper. Um, and I still do 12-step meetings, not as much as I used to, maybe a couple times a year. I do them mostly online just for the, you know, interacting with people like myself. But I was super big 12-stepper, and I would cut, oh, if you do this, I'm cutting you out, I'm cutting you out. And then you realize I'm surrounded by no one. I mean, there's a certain point you're surrounded by no one because you're, I had such a rigid thought process. But I would say if it bothers an individual, then they have to decide on that themselves. Some people, it really, really bothers them. Yes. So I've been clean a long time, and I have a group of friends that used to used to use. I have I, one of my friends used to be at the methadone clinic that I used to work at. So years after uh, he got years after he left the clinic, we ended up becoming friends. He was in going to meetings and stuff like that. So I see I would say that just anecdotally, the people who didn't die, most of them have gotten clean. Most of them. But that's um, you know, I lived in what we call the era of AIDS. I would say the, the majority of my friends that I used with are dead. Uh, either for, and then from overdoses, murders, and from, um, from, you know, from, from AIDS before they had their, the antiretrovirals. So for the people who survived, there's kind of like a close-knit af uh, affinity that you have with people like that who lived through those periods of time. Um, and then I, you know, but I've seen a lot of people, I've seen, this is one thing, if you work, if you work as a treatment provider, you can never tell who's going to get clean. Never, 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 never. Because people, people told me I was not going to get, people were like, so they, they have these means, these used to be so depressing. They'd have 80 people in the room and they would say, statistically, of the 80 people in the room, two of you are going to make it. So I said, well, that's cold for 79 of you all because I'm in that one spot. <laughs> and they would, and this treatment facility, it was the treatment facility I was in was so bad they closed it because they had such, they closed the facility because they had, CDC, the Department of Corrections had said they had so few successes there, they closed the facility. Uh, and they made it, now it's Father Alfred Center, it's another rehab, but uh, the, the thing about it was that I just had made up my mind I was not going to use anymore. I just, that's it. I've never, I've never relapsed. I just, I'm, that's it. I'm not doing it. And so people call, I call myself sort of the junkie unicorn in that, and that I'm just, you know, 
this creature that people exist somewhere, but people have never met that creature. But I'm, I'm really, but I had, but it took me 11 times to get to that place, like where I would kind of be like, well, I'm gonna sort of, I'm gonna try this, but not do this. I'm gonna stop doing heroin, but I'm gonna do crystal meth, or I'm gonna stop drinking, but I'm gonna do that. You know, I always tried sort of meandering my way through things. But I just said, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try total absence. That's why for me, total absence does not bother me at all. I'm cool with total absence because I've tried, I've been trying, I call it manipulating outcomes. I'm trying, I've always tried to like manipulate the outcomes to make it work out my way and it always turns out to be like big, big shit storm mess. So it's like, I'm not trying to manipulate any outcomes. Absence works for me. Uh, and I'm satisfied with that. Like, I don't think there's any, I don't feel like there's any drug experience I miss. I've done my share of hanging off the chandelier and all that other kind of stuff. I'm, I'm good. I'm in a good place. I'm glad you're reading my book. Thank you. When you had panic attacks and sobriety, how did you handle that? Okay, so I went to the nurse practitioner, and the nurse practitioner said there's various things you, you can try. So I ended up doing, uh, so I have emergency Ativan because I have had situations that were completely unsafe medically, and I've only taken them a handful of times in four years. I've taken them a handful of times where I've had panic. I haven't had any, I haven't had to take them for like two years, but I have had a few situations where I was stuck out in public and I had a panic attack and I had to make it home. So I hate the way that they make me feel. It's, I ask them, can you give me the lowest dose out of van possible, the minimum amount possible, just enough so I have them in case of an emergency. And then I did meditation tapes. So um, I did meditation tapes. I did, uh, CBT work, workbooks, so I'm kind of a, you know, in the school where they have you work in teams, I'm always a person who wants to work by themselves. Like, I'm the kind of person I like to work by myself. So I did the CBT workbooks. Um, there's a lot of different worksheets that you can do. So I worked on different things. And I also, one of the things that I got assessed, it turns out I have perimenopause, and perimenopause, uh, the hormonal changes can lead to anxiety and panic disorder. So, uh, so I ruled out all the different kind of medical stuff first. And since I've been receiving, I've been taking herbal supplements and changing my diet and do, I know I have like a meditation when I get super anxious and stuff like that. I haven't had to take any kind of medication, but it was a, it was a really difficult. I, what happened was a precipitating event. I was driving my, I had dropped all my kids off at the daycare. I was driving my car going 70 miles an hour on the highway and I had a panic attack on the highway. Uh, which was, on, I'm sorry, out of nowhere. I had a panic attack on the highway. So, uh, so there was a certain amount of needing to function that, that I, that's why I agreed to take the medication. Um, but I, th then they wanted to put me on psychiatric medication and I, I didn't want to take the psychiatric medication. I preferred to try the other methods first. Not that I'm against psychiatric medication. I just personally chose to try something else first. Is that it, Byron? I see you walking down the stairs. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>